Hello, a Health Podacy listener, Jeff from Health Affairs here. We hope that you're enjoying and getting value out of a Health Podacy so far. We all enjoy making it for you. Uh, but it's a new product, and we're still working out some kinks. Uh, to be upfront, the audio on this week's episode isn't 100% ideal. Uh, we internally discussed the options, uh, but ultimately felt that Dr. Acevedo Garcia's paper and the conversation was too important to hold. So thanks in advance for understanding, and thank you for listening. And now, enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to A Health Podacy. It is hard to justify an apology when it happens uh, between neighborhoods that are really close to each other. I'm your host, Alan Weil. Today, we're talking about the opportunities children have or don't have to grow and thrive based on where they live. We've long known that resources in a community, whether it's good schools, places to walk, places to buy healthy food, affect the opportunities for children to develop and live long lives. But how do we measure these characteristics? And how do we use our knowledge about them to make better policy? Today, I'll be talking to Dr. Dolores Acevedo Garcia, professor at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. Dr. Acevedo Garcia published a paper in the October 2020 issue of Health Affairs that uses the Child Opportunity Index to describe neighborhood characteristics as they affect children. Her paper reports large racial and ethnic disparities in opportunity and discusses the policy interventions that could improve the future for all children. Dr. Acevedo Garcia, welcome to the program. Thank you, Alan. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's start with the basics. What is this Child Opportunity Index? Sure. The index is a measure of children's neighborhood environment as children experience their neighborhoods today in the U.S. It's a measure of the resources and conditions that are important for healthy child development. And it's available for each of the about 72,000 neighborhoods in the U.S. That is nearly all the neighborhoods in the U.S. It includes 29 indicators of factors that are important for children. For example, availability of early childhood education, academic outcomes in neighborhood schools, availability of healthy food, walkability and green space, etc. And one measure that we use a lot because it's very intuitive and simple is the Child Opportunity Score. So what we do is that uh, based on the Child Opportunity Index for each neighborhood, we rank all 72,000 neighborhoods in the U.S. according to their Child Opportunity, and then we divide them into 100 equal groups. So, for example, um, the Child Opportunity Score 1 indicates that a neighborhood's opportunity is equivalent to that experienced by the 1% of children living in the neighborhoods with the lowest child opportunity in the nation. And conversely, a neighborhood with a score of 100 has opportunity equivalent to that experienced by the 1% of children living in neighborhoods with the highest child opportunity. So our score ranges from 1 to 100. And this simple and intuitive measure allows us to capture geographic and racial and ethnic differences in children's neighborhoods. You have this very robust tool looking at a lot of different dimensions that converts into a number, which is, as you say, very intuitive. Why are these characteristics at the neighborhood level so important if we're trying to understand how children fare and what their opportunities are uh, for a successful life? Sure. Um, I think that we all intuitively know that where we live shapes many aspects of our lives. The air that we breathe, the quality of our housing, whether we have access to green spaces, how far we need to travel to go to work, etc. These factors in neighborhoods also shape children's lives, of course, and they are especially important for children because children are growing and developing very rapidly. So these influences in childhood are going to have long-lasting effects. Obviously, uh, neighborhood conditions influence the experience that children have today in their neighborhoods, and we want children to have high-quality experiences. But they also affect their development and their health and educational outcomes in childhood, as well as longer term, their health and socioeconomic outcomes, for example, employment and income as adults. And uh, there are multiple ways in which neighborhoods can influence children, of course. Some of them, I think, are more intuitive. For example, uh, the quality of the environment, for example, the number of days with excess heat or the level of air pollution have effects on health, including children's health. 
Other factors uh, are important because they facilitate access to healthy living, for example, the availability of healthy food outlets. And other factors are related to the presence and quality of institutions that support children and families, for example, early childhood education centers. Other factors that have to do with um, the socioeconomic uh, composition of the neighborhood are important because they influence the norms and expectations for the future that children develop. For example, if a youth live in a neighborhood where the norm is for children to graduate from high school and adults in the neighborhood tend to hold professional jobs, that may signal to youth that those outcomes are possible for them too, and that may influence their behavior. So there are multiple pathways, and of course, this is a very complicated set of influences. And the beauty and the power of an index, including our Child Opportunity Index, is that we can get an understanding of these multiple factors in one number. So that's where we start. You take this intuitive sense that we know neighborhoods matter and we know their characteristics matter. You look at the evidence and pull out the aspects of that 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 are tied to future success. And one of the findings, uh, unfortunately not surprising, but really pops out, is that the differences that children have based on their race or ethnicity are profound. Tell me a little more about what the evidence shows. Sure. Um, first of all, you're absolutely right. The differences in child neighborhood opportunity are profound. And they are rooted in the very high levels of residential segregation that exists in the United States. Um, the inequities in the neighborhood conditions that children experience are dramatic and really simply unacceptable from a moral point of view, but also from a health equity and societal point of view. Uh, children are very highly residentially segregated, actually more segregated than the population as a whole. What this means more specifically is that Black and Hispanic children tend to live in separate neighborhoods from white children. And this has enormous consequences for opportunities for healthy development. For example, in the U.S., public school attendance is largely based on the neighborhoods where we live. And this means, of course, that if our neighborhoods are segregated, our schools are also very segregated. So our neighborhoods and also our schools are not only separate, but unequal. We have known for a long time that Black and Hispanic children are more likely to experience neighborhoods of concentrated poverty. And poverty is a very important factor. Neighborhood poverty is a key factor for sure. But with the index, we also wanted to look into how unequal by race and ethnicity and also geographically access to neighborhood resources is by, for example, early education, vocability, pollution. And that's what the Child Opportunity Index allows us to do. When we look at our maps, we have a map for every single metro, and we can see all the neighborhoods within that metro. The patterns are visually striking, shocking. We immediately see clusters of white children in higher opportunity neighborhoods and clusters of black and Hispanic children in lower opportunity neighborhoods. But of course, the visual impression is not as powerful sometimes as a number that um, we can use to compare more specifically. And there are a number of ways that we can compare access to neighborhood opportunity by race and ethnicity. One useful way is to think about across our 100 largest metropolitan areas, what is the proportion of children that live in very low opportunity neighborhoods? Almost half of black children live in very low opportunity neighborhoods, 46%. One third, 33% of Hispanic children live in very low opportunity neighborhoods. And that is in huge contrast with white children, of whom only 6% live in very low opportunity neighborhoods. Another way of uh, trying to grasp what this means is to look at the magnitude of these inequities in terms of the number of children affected. Nearly 10 million children today in our 100 largest metro areas live in very low opportunity neighborhoods, exactly 9.8 million children. Of these children, the largest group, racial and ethnic group of children living in very low opportunity neighborhoods is Hispanic children. 4.5 million of them live in very low opportunity neighborhoods, followed by, by black children. 3.6 million black children live in very low opportunity neighborhoods. Another very important finding is that uh, many people will think Black and Hispanic children are more likely to live in poor families, so their families are going to be less likely to afford housing in neighborhoods with higher opportunity. That's why we see these racial and ethnic differences. So in order to uh, examine that question, we did the analysis also for children living in poor families. 
And what we find is that even when we concentrate the analysis only on, uh, on the children in poor families, we still see huge pressure on ethnic disparities. 66% of poor black children and 50% of poor Hispanic children live in very low opportunity neighborhoods. That is compared to only 20% of poor white children. So why is this important? First of all, it's telling us that these differences in neighborhood opportunity are influenced by family socioeconomic status, but that's not the only reason that they exist. Uh, and the main part of the story, uh, we think, is a long history of racialized and racist structures that we have in our country, for example, in housing. Uh, and the second reason that is very important is because we have learned um, over the years that children that experience childhood adversity uh, experiences are more likely to experience poor developmental outcomes. And our findings show that Black and Hispanic children are much more likely than white children to simultaneously live in a poor family and in a very low opportunity neighborhood. And this is important because there is evidence that living in better neighborhoods has protective effects on poor children. So Black and Hispanic children are experiencing simultaneously different types of disadvantage. And when we think about income, we know that there are parts of the country that have higher incomes, parts that have lower. It sounds, though, from your work, like the differences across regions of the country aren't as important as the differences inside a metropolitan area. I live in the greater Washington, D.C. area. We're a relatively wealthy region. But according to your work, it doesn't matter if you're here. It matters where you are in this region. Is, am I reading that correctly? Yes, absolutely. You are reading that correctly. And it's actually one of the most important findings of our work and also a finding that really we were not expecting. We would uh, expect a lot of variation, as you said, across the country initially, because we know that regions have their different levels of economic prosperity and different economic structures. So you naturally would expect a child in Bakersfield, California, to live in a lower opportunity a neighborhood than a child in the Boston area. And we did find geographic variation across the country between metros. But what we found is that 91% of the variation in neighborhood opportunities found within metropolitan areas. That has very important policy implications because no one can argue that a metro region does not have prosperity to sustain a higher level of opportunity across the region between neighborhoods for all children. You could argue that two very different metros just have very different situations, very different realities. But it's hard to justify inequality when it happens uh, between neighborhoods that are really close to each other. So sadly, what we find is that often children living a few miles apart in the best and worst neighborhoods, for example, of Bridgeport, Connecticut, or Detroit, or Boston, experience more dramatically different neighborhood conditions than, for example, two children living about 1,300 miles apart in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Jackson, Mississippi. We often illustrate that by showing a contrast between two actual neighborhoods to give a sense of the extent of inequality that we are talking about. So let's take, for example, two neighborhoods in Detroit that I'm going to call A and B. And these neighborhoods are actual neighborhoods in Detroit, and they happen to be only three miles apart. Obviously, these neighborhoods are very close geographically within the same metro and only three miles apart, but they are literally worlds, worlds apart in terms of child opportunity. They differ along many, many dimensions that matter for children's health and development. For example, neighborhood A has a poverty rate of 52% compared to only 5% in neighborhood B. In neighborhood A, only 30% of children attend early childhood education compared to more than half of children, uh, young children in neighborhood B. And in neighborhood A, 11% of families have limited proximity to healthy food. And in neighborhood B, only 0.2% of families have limited proximity to healthy food. And I can go on and on and on because all the indicators point in the same direction. What is sad is that Detroit or these two neighbors in Detroit or the contrast between these two neighbors in Detroit is not unusual. We find this repeatedly across metropolitan areas. And uh, this is obviously something that is very serious and uh, is pointing to the need for policy solutions that try to address some of these inequities at the metropolitan area level. You mentioned the importance of the policy response to address some of the differences we see. 
One of the points you make is that the healthcare sector needs to place more of an emphasis on the social conditions in which people live. Where would you suggest the health sector begin in those kinds of efforts? Sure. The health sector is uh, uniquely positioned to try to do something about this because uh, the healthcare sector serves people that are physically located in neighborhoods and communities. So hospitals, for example, have service areas or catchment areas, and so do clinics. So it's very important for them that people in their catchment area are healthy. And we see the impacts of neighborhood conditions on children's health every day. And hospitals and schools and others that serve neighborhoods know this. Some of the hospitals and the health researchers that are using our Child Opportunity Index data are seeing very strong, very clear correlations between, for example, children living in lower opportunity neighborhoods and children having higher rates of asthma and other conditions, or children having higher rates of preventable emergency room visits. So clearly, it's not only that we want to improve child health and well-being, but also these neighborhood conditions can translate into a lot of um, costs to the healthcare sector. Hospitals and public health departments, as we know, have to do community health needs assessments and implement strategies to improve community health. So one thing that we are doing in our work is looking into how the Child Opportunity Index and other measures can inform this community needs analysis in the health sector so that these analysis and their implementation have a strong focus on health equity and also neighborhood factors that influence children's health. Addressing the child's health uh, requires attention to the neighborhood in which she lives. Our vision is that the health system would have funding and mechanisms that allow, for example, a pediatrician to prescribe better housing or a better neighborhood for a child. But in addition to social interventions at the individual or family level, our vision is that hospitals, public health departments, and stakeholders in the health and also other sectors will move to invest more resources in community health improvements. This is just a vision for now. We see, and of course, Health Affairs is very aware of a lot of discussions of these issues and some examples, very encouraging examples of best practices. But the truth is that expenditures and practices in the health sector are still far from this vision. These differences within a metropolitan area suggest the need for regional solutions so that you don't have the disparities inside those metros uh, that exist now. What uh, would a regional solution look like? Absolutely. I think that often we think about neighborhood disadvantage in terms of something that needs to be addressed only at the neighborhood level, for example, by addressing neighborhoods of concentrated poverty or concentrated disadvantage or very low opportunity. And of course, those place-based initiatives are very valuable. However, we also want to point to the issues of inequality across a region or distribution of resources across a region. Uh, it's often the case that in research and in policy, we focus on areas of concentrated disadvantage, concentrated poverty. However, the flip side of that is concentrated affluence or concentrated opportunity. And the story there is, of course, one of inequality. So we need interventions that are going to uh, create a more equal distribution of resources. Uh, that means that we have to try to have interventions that address metropolitan areas, and some of them are going to be at, even at a higher level, for example, state level. One of the um, uh, policies that we discuss in the paper is that we need zoning regulations that allow for the creation of more um, higher density, more affordable multifamily housing in higher opportunity areas. And part of that effort is going to be at the state level. States are now engaging some of them, at least, for example, Massachusetts, where I live, in state zoning reform. Because the fact is that we uh, have created a lot of barriers and walls between um, different municipal jurisdictions. So we need state action to be able to correct some of that a lack of access, especially for low-income families. Uh, our schools are also very rooted in uh, a local way of financing them through local property taxes, and that also creates a lot of inequality. Some regional solutions are, for example, uh, uh, allowing kids to attend school in a district that is not their own district throughout the metropolitan region. So I think that absolutely some of the solutions go beyond place-based interventions for highly disadvantaged neighborhoods. We need to address in inequity at a higher level of um, governance. 
such as metros and states. You work in an academic institution, you publish in academic journals, but it's very clear from talking to you that ultimately your goal is to affect public policy for people to use this information to think differently about how we do things. The index is oriented to that with, as you say, numerical indicators, things that make it easier to use. Can you give me an example or two of where policymakers have taken this information and used it to shape what they're doing on the ground? First, I want to say that when we published the first index uh, in 2014, Child Opportunity Index 1.0, the most striking uh, aspect of the work is that very soon, and I'm talking about literally days, maybe weeks, but very, very soon, we saw a huge interest on the part of people in different sectors that wanted to have access to the data. So there is a demand for this type of data because a lot of people have a sense of the inequities, but they want to be able to measure them more precisely and identify neighborhoods where conditions are really bad and, of course, try to do something about that. Uh, We have identified communities of users in the housing sector, in the health sector, and also in the early education sector. In the housing sector, uh, housing mobility programs that uh, help families that receive housing assistance from the government, low-income families, and try to find housing in better neighborhoods are using not only our index, but the other indices of neighborhood environment to help families make an informed decision so that they can use their subsidy, for example, their Section 8 voucher to buy housing, to rent housing in the neighborhood that is going to give their children the best resources. So we've been working with some of these programs, and that's uh, something that uh, we are very excited about. In the health sector, uh, we have also seen a lot of interest, for example, on the part of children's hospitals. As I said before, hospitals have to do community health needs assessments, and they also have to have implementation related to that. And that is mandated um, as part of the um, community benefits um, regulations uh, from the IRS. So they have an incentive already to do this, and some of them are getting interested in doing a better job not only in terms of health equity, but also being much more um, uh, targeted in terms of their investments and the programs that they have. So they want to identify neighborhoods of lower opportunity, for example, to try to help children in those neighborhoods and also to try to improve um, some of the conditions in those neighborhoods. So we see really uh, interest across different sectors, uh, and we are now doing work uh, trying to examine what are the policy levers in different sectors for being able to implement policies that have a stronger place-based, equity-based component. Well, Dr. Acevedo Garcia, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. This is an important paper and an interesting paper, and you've brought it to life in a way that only you can. I really appreciate you spending some time with me on a health policy today. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Before hitting the floors of Congress, health policy begins in the pages of health affairs. Stay up to date with the latest research and insights by subscribing to the leading peer-reviewed health policy journal today. As a nonpartisan forum, health affairs addresses today's leading issues in healthcare. Look at the articles from our October issue. Janet Curry explains why the U.S. underinvests in child health, while Dolores Acevedo Garcia explores community-level health equity opportunity gaps. By subscribing, not only do you have access to more than 30 years of health affairs back catalog, but also access to a head of print articles. Subscribe by visiting our website at www.healthaffairs.org. A Health Policy is produced by Health Affairs, the leading journal for health policy research. Jeff Byers produces the show under the direction of Patty Sweet. Brian Dobbs edits the show. Sue Ducat and Sarah Kolk helped dot the I's and cross the T's with scheduling. Julia Vivalo produced the artwork. Music by Brian Dobbs and Julia Vivalo. Like the show? Subscribe to A Health Policy on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And please leave us a review. It helps others find the show. Thanks for listening and have a great morning, day, or evening.